moving on to another of these myths that I wanted to to address. And this one actually came up in an episode that I did with somebody I know you've spoken with, uh, Chiara Mingarelli at sure. Yale now. But the question is, why isn't there just one electron? And Chiara Mingarelli, she, she mentioned this almost like it was a fact. And I was surprised by that just because I think you mentioned that John, this was something John Wheeler suggested to Richard Feynman. But I'm wondering if this is really, to use the word again, sort of an enduring myth within physics communities and and why uh, there isn't just one electron out there. Yeah, I think it is a little bit of an enduring myth, but also, you know, physics is a big field. Chiara is a brilliant physicist doing gravitational wave astronomy, and you're asking her a question about quantum field theory, so she's going to give you the myth. The deeper quest, the deeper answer is no, there's not just one electron, there's a field. There's the electron field that has vibrations in it. The reason why every electron has the same mass and charge is because they are all vibrations in the same underlying field. But what would be the intuition behind there only being one electron in the first place? Oh, that's a good question. And that it actually did make sense. Like in the modern way of putting it, a little bit anachronistic because the modern way of putting it didn't exist back then. But you can have things um, in quantum mechanics, in quantum field theory, like an electron and a positron the anti-electron, they come together and they annihilate and they spit out two photons or something like that. So if you think about that process, there's an electron and a positron coming in, no electrons or positrons coming out, just photons, right? But the in the Feynman diagram that you would draw for this kind of process, um, there's one line that sort of contains electric charge. It contains electric charge, negative charge for the electron, but then you have to connect it to the positron because electron electric charge is conserved. And now the positron uh, can be thought of as an electron going backward in time, mathematically. It's not really going backward in time, but the mathematical description of a positron is just a time-reversed electron. So if you see, I have one time-reversed electron and one electron, and then they turn into nothing, Wheeler says, well, maybe I can think about that as one electron traveling forward in time and then continuing its journey backward in time, identified as the positron. And maybe that one electron just zigs back and forth to beat the band throughout the history of the universe. That can't work because electrons and positrons, electrons can annihilate into things other than photons and annihilate in ways that do not involve positrons. And so the number of electrons minus positrons is not actually conserved over time. But uh, we can, it, it see, it's clear why it was tempting and it, it inspired Richard Feynman to help derive the whole Feynman diagram way of talking about these things. To be, well, maybe this wasn't, mentioned in, in your response but this line of reasoning it doesn't does it apply to all particles was wheeler suggesting that there's only one of every particle or this is just particular to electrons i think back in the day uh, for very good reasons they were focusing on electrons positrons and photons so this is the 40s or 50s right so qed quantum electrodynamics is the theory that just has electrons positrons and photons so that's what they were thinking about they didn't know about the standard model of particle physics, as we currently understand it. I mean, if Wheeler had thought about it a little bit more, he would have known that a neutron can convert into a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino. So there were zero positrons and electrons, and now there's one, so it couldn't be that there's only one electron in the whole world. <laughs> 